Welcome everyone. Um, my name is Molly Brown. Welcome to everyone who is here. Thank you to our panelists for joining us. I'm a transfer advisor at North Seattle College. Um, and today we're really lucky to have um, some terrific panelists to talk about STEM and what they did and pathways you might follow. Um, we're going to start with a question for each of them and allow them to introduce themselves. Um, and the question is, what sparked your interest in STEM? Please share a brief summary of your educational and career journey in your field. I'll go alphabetically and ask Alyssa Agnello to start. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Alyssa Agnello. I'm the Dean of Math and Science at North Seattle College. Um, and um, I wish I had this you know, magical moment that sparked my interest in STEM. I was looking, we're thinking back on this and realizing that I think it mostly was just a bunch of little moments of um, getting excited about little things or having people tell me, oh, you're pretty good at this when I was doing, you know, math and science as a kid. And honestly, I do not think I'm better than most kids in kind of exploring the world, but just having those little bits of encouragement kind of had me in my mind say, wait, maybe I am kind of good at this. Um, and so I think because of that, I always wanted to go into teaching and, and create those moments for, for other people. And so um, I first pursued chemistry because I kind of like the idea of having all these little building blocks, like little Legos, little molecules that you could build together. Um, and then once you build those things in chemistry, um, you get to start studying how properties change and how things work in the world, how they can be used and what the applications are. And so from there, it brought me into the field of nanotechnology and material science. Um, so those I became introduced to in college. And so I went to graduate school um, for chemistry and nanotech and material science. And um, straight out of graduate school, I came to North to start teaching and then moved into administration. So that was, that was my path. And thanks for having me here today. All right, thanks. Next, let's go to Caroline Pugh. Hi, um, I'm Caroline and my science journey actually started at North Seattle College uh, as a student. <laughs> so I never intended to go into a STEM career, but STEM just kind of like grabbed me and hooked me without my permission. Um, I'm just kidding. It was with my permission. Um, consent is very important. But uh, what happened was that part of my distribution requirements, as many of you who are AA um, degree seeking students know is that you have to do some natural world lab science and um, I you know kind of put it off till later in my career process which a lot of people do who might be feeling anxious about um, math or, or science and that was me um, and I took a class with Tracy Furitani who by the way is still teaching at North so you can check him out in physics um, but at that time he was teaching earth science and I took a field geology course where we actually got to go out and do real um, field geology work and learn about how that um, occurred and I found out that I really loved field work because you're actually taking all of this theoretical knowledge that you learn in the classroom and you're applying it to real life problems and trying to get answers to questions that you have. And also it meant spending a lot of time in the outdoors, which I loved as well. So I kind of fell in love with science then, um, but I was still really nervous about the math and science prerequisites. So I continued <laughs> <laughs> on my original trajectory, which was to be a German studies major. Yeah, you heard that right. Uh, German history and language, um, which I was interested in because my, my grandmother was um, of German descent. Uh, but I kept having this real pull towards science, but I just, I, I didn't feel like I had the math and science background to do it. Um, and I took another field geology course because I just kept doing that um, for fun because it was interesting to me. And I finally realized like I need to, I need to go for this. This is really where my passion lies. And so I took a whole extra year of college and really just went back and did basic math all the way up through the prereqs that I needed to do um, the geology degree. I did a bunch of science. And so I was taking like three math and science classes every quarter for like four quarters in a row while I was working multiple part-time jobs. And I feel like this might resonate with a lot of you. Um, and 
then I, I got into geology and I loved it and really resonate with what Alyssa shared that all along the way, I had teachers like Tracy who really inspired me with their enthusiasm and with the fact that they like reached out to me and, and, and saw me struggling or saw me being interested in this topic and said, you know, I believe you can do it. Um, and, and I want that for all of my students, whether they choose to go into a STEM career or they just need to get that math or science prereq so that they can go on to what really makes them passionate. Like that is really what, what drives me and why I came back to teach here and bring that full circle. Thanks, Caroline. Moving on to Catherine Thomas. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. I'm so um, glad to be here with you all today. Uh, so my name is Catherine Thomas and I'm the current uh, program manager for the LSAMP program at North Seattle. If you don't know what that is, I'd be more than happy to talk with you about that after the seminar. Um, so uh, what sparked my interest in STEM? I pretty much grew up in it. So I would say it was really my, um, my father's advocacy that I get um, introduced to it, immersed in it and engaged with it at a young age. So pretty much most of my memories um, are around um, outside of school and church, the things that we did as a family were go to, to um, science centers. And um, when campuses, college campuses would have um, like science fairs or um, like visiting um, demonstrations and things like University of Maryland had this thing called physics is fun and you could get engaged and that was really like an outreach for um, not only um, young children but their families as well I mean those are just things that that's just what we did and so um, I was in the um, in high school they kind of put students in tracks and so I um, got onto the science and tech track. And then by senior year, I had it, had exposure to aerospace engineering through a class that I taught. And then um, my professor hand uh, at the time, my teacher at the time handed me a pamphlet um, for Tuskegee University and there. And he was like, hey, why don't you check this out? They had an aerospace engineering program. They're the only historically black college that had an aerospace engineering program at the time. And I was like, sure, why not? And so. <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, that's pretty much how I ended up um, in STEM, um, and I stuck, um, I continued on um, through it. I didn't graduate from Tuskegee, I ended up transferring to University of Maryland um, to complete my degree, um, and then um, after that just had some opportunities to like work with the National Transportation Safety Board, which um, does um, accident investigations. And then I went to graduate school and got to work and do some flight testing and then attended a Society of Women Engineers conference and Boeing was hiring. So um, I'd love to talk to folks more about the power of technical conferences after the seminar, ask me. And um, Boeing was hiring and I was fortunate to not only get the interview, but get hired. And so I went from the East Coast to the West Coast, and that's why I'm here um, in Seattle today. And that is my journey. <laughs> Thanks. And I also want to say thank you to Catherine for helping organize this and coming up with the name Seminars at North. So if you want to see more events, please let us know what you would like to see um, and get to know the LS AMP program as well. Um, and um, I'm going to go on, Bill, I'm using your full name in the alphabet, so I'm going to go to Dom. Hey, everybody. Yeah, so my name is Dominic Juarez. Uh, currently, I'm a systems engineer at Boeing, but the route that I took to get there is probably super untraditional and unorthodox, and I would start by saying, like, in high school, I grew up, well, first, I grew up very poor. Um, when I say that, I say on Section A and housing, uh, food stamps was how we how we ate or provided our food. But with that mind state, that was the one thing that motivated me to get into college and to go somewhere is because that was a, something I didn't want to do again. And I was just discussing uh, the the pivotal point for me, which got me into STEM, was my chemistry my chemistry class in high school. And in high school, we did this um, was it a lab where we mixed chemicals and then made some uh, hand lotion. And so when I was doing that, I was like, oh, 
I can scale this production and I can sell it to people locally and have my own lotion going around. <laughs> um, and so that was, that was my mind state. And um, unfortunately I was expelled from school. Uh, so I had to go and get my GED. Now, what happened with that was when I got my GD, I went and enrolled into uh, a program in Everett Community College to, it was called, it was like, it's kind of like a similar like running start, but it was for uh, youth that have dropped out of high school. And so it was called U3, U3 engagement. Um, and so I pursued uh, some, I took some courses to kind of figure out what I wanted to do. And then one of the courses really kind of honed in on like, where do you want to project your career to go? And so what I did is I looked at the highest paid careers because again, like growing up in my background, I was like, money is the biggest uh, barrier for my life. And so I don't want that to ever happen again. So I went for like the top three careers. That top three careers at the time was like a surge, a neurosurgeon. And I was like, I don't want anybody's lives in my hands. So I decided not to do that. And then also an anesthesiologist and an anesthesiologist is the one that puts you to sleep. Um, and I was like, that's also sounds very risky. Uh, and then the third one was an orthodontist. And so I went into school pursuing to be an orthodontist, took all my chemistry, my um, biology courses. And during that time when I was taking my biology courses, I got introduced to, um, was it biomechanical engineering and working with prosthetics. Um, but I was so determined to not change my major. I continued to pursue biology. I went to the UW, uh, UW Bothell campus and was pursuing biology. And then they had just introduced a mechanical engineering degree and so I was like, you know, I really want to do this mechanical engineering stuff, but I'll do bio as well. I tried to do that both and that kind of failed miserably. So I decided to pursue mechanical engineering instead. Um, and then after I graduated with a degree in mechanical engineering, I got hired on um, CMAR, CMAR Community Health Centers, uh, with the, some experience that I did with 3D printing at the University of Washington. Um, I went into CMAR as like a startup kind of pioneering um, additive manufacturing is what they call it, but it's 3D printing within dental industry. So people, I, I helped CMAR get on that uh, track to do 3D printing for a uh, different variety of specialties. So like for orthodontics, I can print out the uh, somebody's teeth and um, the orthodontist can come in and kind of measure what they needed, the corrections that they needed to make. Um, and so I got introduced to that and what happened was I, I really liked what I was doing. I loved being at CMAR, but there was uh, somebody that told me about doing 3D printing at Boeing. And so I was like, okay, I didn't really care for Boeing or ever wanted to go to Boeing, but I was like, you know what? I might consider it. So I was going to a conference, um, the Confer NSBE convention, the NES National Society of Black Engineers convention, where like there's about 10,000 students that come there, 10,000 people that uh, aggregate or congregate. And I stood in line in Boeing for like two hours and I got to the front of the line and they said, um, I was looking for that 3D printing job and they didn't have it there. So after two hours of waiting, I just picked uh, two random um, jobs, which was like R&D manufacturing and systems engineering. And because I waited for the two hours, I wasn't gonna leave without getting uh, at least an informal interview. And after I got in and I talked to the, the managers, the hiring managers, um, mm -hmm. I got selected to go to both interviews, but then the systems engineering one was the one that I actually took. And that's kind of my long, my long path to where I am now. Great, thank you so much. Um, next is Justin or Jay. Hi, thank you. Thank you everybody for having me here. Uh, yeah, my name is Jay Villasis. I'm currently a software engineer uh, working for Electronic Arts, it's EA. Uh, currently I work for their EA mobile division uh, in their central, te the central technology team. Uh, as far as how I got into STEM, uh, I'm going to be a little bit like Dom, and it's actually, it was a bit of a roundabout one. Uh, so for me, uh, my parents came from Ecuador, so I'm first generation, born in the United States. Uh, they were dentists when they came here, and so my entire life was growing up in my parents' dental office, and I thought, yeah, I'm going to be a dentist. They make good money. Uh, I have a backing background for us. So I was, was going to do, that's what I was going to do. So I went to college, I attended the University of San Francisco, pre-med, and studying psychology as my major. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, after my first uh, semester at USF, uh, my parents' financial situation took a massive crash, like absolutely, they completely ran out of money. Uh, and so my college kind of gave me the boot because I just couldn't afford tuition anymore. And that was kind of it. And so uh, I was uh, in San Francisco, didn't know what I was going to do. 
uh, was no longer in school, was paying for an apartment I could barely afford, uh, you know, working, working my job. I you know, part-time, uh, uh, not real estate, uh, part-time uh, uh, sales associate at like Office Depot. Uh, and I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And I decided, I remembered I loved playing video games as a kid. Um, and I started looking at what does it take to get a career in video games? And this is probably my favorite part of the story is how I ended up in STEM. So in video games, there's a ton of disciplines from artists, so a ton of different stuff. So STEM is a small part of it, but it's a pretty big part. And so I looked at a survey of people who work in games companies who gets paid the most. And I just went all the way up the list and software engineers get paid by far the most and the quickest as opposed to the other disciplines in gaming. Um, and I think similar to Dom, for me, you know, I wanted to be a dentist, but I couldn't afford another two years of bachelor's degrees, then to go to graduate school or, you know, to go to dental school and then to specialize. So I just couldn't wait till I was 28, 29 to be financially independent um, and software engineering and not just in games, but software engineering in general, you just need a bachelor's degree and sometimes not even that. And it's a very, for me, it was the quickest way for me to achieve financial independence that I needed with the minimal amount of education. Fortunately, uh, I absolutely love it. I'm so happy I'm an engineer. I love coming to work every single day, uh, even though it was primarily for the money that I decided to do it. Uh, I absolutely love doing it. Um, so anyways, so stayed in San Francisco, got my bachelor's degree in visual and game programming uh, and uh, you know, worked really, really hard in college. And the reason I like to bring this up is just for anyone who's you know, just in STEM or just uh, transferring or thinking about transferring, I didn't write my first line of code until I was 20. Uh, I never took programming classes in high school. I never had any camps or support, but I was 20 years old, took my first programming class. I've now been in the industry for seven, eight years, and I am doing very well in my career, not to, to brag, but I worked very hard at what I did. Um, and so I just want to say it's you know, never too late, no matter what age you are, as long as you like, put in that effort, especially in careers like STEM, you're going to go where you're going to go based on how hard you work. So anyways, Got graduated, worked for a small company, then worked for Blue Mobile, which was like a medium-sized company. Now I worked for Electronic Arts uh, for the last couple of years, and it's, it's it's a great career so far. Absolutely love doing it. Thank you very much. And last but not least, um, B William Bill Berry. Thank you. Um, good to see some present and former students in the group here. So good to see you guys. Um, my journey started, I guess, the, uh, I've always liked math and science, so all through school, I think that was sort of something that I gravitated toward. Uh, but as you spoke, I was thinking um, how much the teachers in my life influenced that path, not just because, uh, you know, uh, they, they told me I should do that, but that they were excited about things and that I saw things that I liked that they liked. So the enthusiasm that they had about the subject and then the encouragement that they gave. So I can remember by name, by place, I've got visual pictures, and this has been since 19, many, many years ago. And I remember their classrooms and their names and they're like, I can name the people who influenced that from chemistry to math to sci natural sciences, right? Uh, so these folks encouraged me, but I really started liking computers when I took a computer science class and I had this fantastic instructor in high school. And, uh, and so I started getting excited. That teacher left. Unfortunately, she retired and we got another instructor who really didn't know anything about computers who were teaching, she was teaching us computer science, not her fault, uh, but I would go to to the old instructor's house and she would teach me some stuff and then I would come back to the classroom and teach my classmates some stuff about programming. So the teachers were encouraging and they were like plugged into the deal and invested in me. And so uh, those things made a difference, right? A big difference. So when I took a programming class in high school, then I started really getting excited about programming. And then uh, in the advent of handheld programmable calculators, I realized not only could I program, but I could program and take the thing with me, right? It's like, this is a thing that I can take around and do the things I want to do. And so all that stuff kind of clicked together. And even though I went through a little bit of a circuitous route in college, early college, I gravitated soon after toward computer science, uh, got that degree, and then started teaching in computer science not long after that. Um, I've also been spent some years at Microsoft and had a technical career there. So it really has all been a combination of STEM and teaching uh, that has really gotten me going. And so I don't think my life would feel complete without having had a good helping of both of those things. So, uh, you know, I love having been in the, that field and being able to bring some of that same 
hopefully students enthusiasm and uh, you know bringing you bringing out the creativity that you have and getting you excited about all of these things and sort of sharing all of that enthusiasm that was uh, that was shared with me trying to share that with students is a is a really uh, a privilege to do so that's how i arrived here in a nutshell all right thank you and just so we give our um participants, our students, a little bit of chance to share what they're interested in. I'm going to launch a poll and I just like to ask the students to answer that real quickly. Um, and we'll also be able to, you know, take questions for the panelists in the chat. Um, so please feel free to put some questions in the chat. We had a couple from um, the RSVP form. Um, so let me just look at that. Um, one question that came up, um, which I think is maybe applicable to multiple people, is what's a good way to see if someone is a good fit for STEM or maybe a particular career? I can take a stab at that. Um... And for, for the record, my, my, my answer is going to be biased towards software engineering, because obviously the profession I'm in. Uh, but I would say, in, in my experience, a lot of this, what STEM offers, there is so much like free coursework online and YouTube and videos and different resources, uh, meetups. Like, there's just like, like, speaking from the engineering side, there is such a big community of people who want to teach engineering and want to work with other engineers uh, who make games together. Uh, I would say definitely you know, dip your toes into just what's on the internet, to be honest, like, again, you'll find in almost any like subject career, like deep, deep dives, summaries, uh, projects that you can do together with other people by yourself at home, if you need to, uh, to just see if it's even something you're interested in, um, to be perfectly honest. I don't know if this quite answers the question, but I know one thing when you're first learning math and science, it's, it's it's reassuring in a way that there's usually a right answer. And so I know there was definitely a moment from in my career where you had to accept in science, there's not always a right answer and things don't always work out. And so that's kind of a hard, um, I think a lot of people um, who like step at first sometimes get turned, away, turned off by it when they realize that things don't always work out as they're supposed to on paper. Um, and I also think kind of flipping on its head is if you don't like science, you might be hesitant about science because you're afraid of not getting the right answer and you like to think more broadly. As you get further into science, there are many opportunities to use that creativity and think more broadly and use that as an asset. So um, really STEM is so broad, there's something for everyone in it. Um, and it's just kind of figuring out what, what works with what excites you, I think, and what you're, like Jay was saying, what you are inspired to work hard at doing because you find it fun. Okay, I'm going to end the polling and just give us a little bit of a glimpse of who is in our audience. Um, as I expect, lots of people who want to go into computer science, mm -hmm. um, but also a fair amount of um, biology, chemistry, environmental science, um, and then as far as universities, um, yep, the big dog across the highway, UW Seattle, but a smattering of others. And we have our first question in the chat. Um, and that is, um, and everybody can read that too. How do we analyze companies and research institutions for moral compatibility? Um, how are you confident? No, no, you're confident in what your ability to get there, but which institutions will value what you're about, what you value? Go ahead, Caroline. Oh, okay. Um, so I think that this is a really great question. And I think um, there's different levels of your career where you're going to want to reevaluate this. And um, I'm curious for the person who asked it, are you thinking of going on a pathway that um, has bachelor's as a terminal degree? Or are you thinking of going beyond bachelor's? That would help me um, maybe formulate a little bit of how I respond. And feel free to unmute. Okay, well, maybe I'll just respond a couple different ways and hopefully it hits the points that you're looking for. So I know for myself, when I went for my bachelor's, I wasn't um, 
thinking at a sophisticated level about those sorts of things yet. I, I went through Running Start, and so I got out with my two-year degree when I was like 18. Um, and so I, I wasn't really prepared to go to a, a university, but I did anyway. And I think that happens for a lot of us. We kind of do it because that's the thing that, you know, your parents tell you you should be doing. Um, but when I went to grad school, that became a lot more important to me um, because I had more awareness and sophistication as a student to, to know to ask those kinds of questions that you already know to ask, which is super cool. Um, so if you're going to grad school, if you're working in any area that has research involved, they usually have a list of all of the different research groups within the department that you're applying to. And what I actually did for grad school is I reached out to those um, research group. Um, usually there's a principal investigator or there's somebody who's like a lead on each of those research groups. And you can read about what kinds of research they've already done and what publications they have. Um, you can see who the grad students are that work with them. And I think it can be useful to meet with those professors who are like the research leads, but I think it's even more instructive to meet with their grad students. So if you can have the opportunity to engage with people who are already in that student position and hear from them what it's like, um, that was the most instructive thing for me when choosing where to go and which instructor to work with. Additionally, I highly recommend that students consider going to a college that has multiple professors they would consider working with in case one doesn't work out, because sometimes there are personality conflicts or there are changes in funding, um, and you don't want to get partway through a degree and then find out that you have to switch institutions. Um, it does happen sometimes, and it's totally workable, but it's a lot more challenging than just switching to a different program within the same school. So also looking at if you're not exactly sure which precise department you want to go to, like for me, I thought about geology, atmospheric sciences, or chemistry, and I ended up doing a little bit of both, but I technically went through the School of Geology. Um, so thinking about that piece too, if you change your mind, if you find out something different, are there ways for you to pivot? Um, and then I'll let other folks talk about the industry part. And can we have Dong speak to that? Yeah. Okay, I just want to make sure you hear me. Um, yeah, for as far as when it comes to the companies, uh, what I'm going to say is it probably hits your question in a roundabout way. Um, when you go to interview, you can always, you're always, they always give you an opportunity to ask them questions. Um, so I would say that's the perfect opportunity to ask them questions um, and see what they value. And typically when you're going to an interview, they also want to present the best things about their company as well. Um, and you can definitely do your own research. I think what I really wanted to emphasize on is like is being present as yourself and showing the ideas and the values that you you um you hold all the time. So when I showed up to my interview, um, not to say like I want to condone these things, but like when I showed up to my interview, I had my earrings in, I had my nose ring in, I had my beard. Like I didn't I didn't really change a whole lot about who I am. And then also in the interview, when we talked, um, they they just had some uh, they asked me a question like, is there anything else you want to state? And I didn't, I didn't state any, or I just kind of stated a little bit about my story and just like how appreciative I was to have that opportunity um, and to learn about the, the job because the job that I took, the systems engineering role, um, I had no idea what that role was before I interviewed for it. So let that be known as well. And they took the time and they allowed, they showed me that um, they showed me and they displayed through the interview process because I, I interviewed at Boeing twice that day. Um, the other team was vastly different in how they how they interviewed. And so the way they the people I interviewed with that I got hired on with, they um, they showed me that they valued who I was as a person. Like by the end of that meeting, they're like, they're, the question they asked me is like, Dom, we were a world class company that hires world class individuals. And they're like, are you world class? And I sat there, my head was like, I don't know, am I world class? Like, that's a good question. And then, and then they answered it for me, like, we believe you are. And then I was like, yeah, yeah, you know what, I am. Um, but it was just that, that, that feeling and that value that they showed that they valued who I was as a person, which then in return um, made me value the company that much more. And that's when I said, like, I didn't want to go, I didn't want to work at Boeing initially. But afterwards, after I got into Boeing, I started to see how different the culture was um, from my 
based on my prejudice of what of Boeing, like the culture was very, very different. And the people there was not just those two people, but it was also the everybody else that I started to work with as well. Whereas um, they treated me the exact same way. They want to see you grow. They want to help you be successful. And so I would say, yeah, it's a long, long, long winded answer to your question. Okay, let's do one more response to this one. And um, Bill, you had your hand up. Yeah, I was just going to say there's there's a couple of different ways, but echoing what was said before, you have to be a little bit careful about the company always putting their best uh, foot forward when you're interviewing. That's not always the right you know the right way to ascertain these you know the information that you're looking for here. Um, internships are a good way because there's nothing like being inside the company and then kind of seeing how the culture is in the real world. So if you get a chance to intern, uh, that's a way to kind of dip your toe in without committing full time and you get to really experience the thing internally a little bit. Networking is great because if you can meet some people in a different setting, if you can meet them at conferences or wherever you meet those folks and you you find people who aren't just in sales mode for that company all the time and they'll start talking to you about the pros and cons and what they like and don't like about their job you, you know the better the better that you can get um, in an environment that is not the sales interview environment the more likely you have a chance of you know really understanding what's going on at the company right and some of it you aren't going to know right you can even intern and sometimes even for internships i know at microsoft it was just a ridiculous celebration of internships we went to bill's house they bought us an xbox they bought us like these people were just showered with all kinds of stuff that's not necessarily the experience you're going to have day to day so best attempt you know you can you can do your best and sometimes you're just going to have to work for the company a while and find out what it's really really like but hopefully you can get some ideas from these other sources Okay, and Alyssa, you had um, a specific response you wanted to share? Yeah, and I was also just going to say, um, you know, we're all pretty much Google sleuths at this point. And just looking through a company website, looking at who's on your board, something like equity and inclusion is important to you. Are you noticing that everyone on the board has the same last name? Maybe it's a family, you know, there are different ways to kind of look into that or trying to figure out if the organization has affinity groups for a certain population that they identify with. So just ways to kind of figure out, you know, um, Oh, another thing is who their funders are. So if you are, you know, personally equally opposed to some cause, um, make sure the funding or the research is being funded by that area. And it's hard to figure out a lot of the, you know, making assumptions, but um, it can be telling or it can arm you as you go in to ask those questions during interview. All right, thank you. We've got a lot of questions coming in in the chat. Some of them are pretty specific. I'm going to try to get to as many as possible, uh, but we're going to stick to time too. So the next one I want to go to is what are some roadblocks or setbacks you've faced? Um, and how did you get past them? Um, we had another kind of question in mind in terms of um, how did you find support? Um, and a mentor, and I, um, I wonder if those two things might go together. Um, Jay, do you want to speak to that? Yeah, I, I would love to. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, great question. Um, I will say, in my personal experience, and again, with being a software engineer and coding, I remember distinctly being like my first year in college, learning how to code for the first time, and feeling like I was the dumbest person in the world. There's no, I just wasn't getting it. Um, and it just took me sitting down and accepting that I'm going to have some kind of late nights. I'm going to have not some weekends where I'm not going to really be able to do anything. I'm going to just have to buckle down until I understood the material so well that I could rearticulate it. And, you know, it sounds pretty terrible. It kind of starts, starts pretty uh, daunting. But what I will say is once you get over that first initial roadblock, once you just bang your head against that brick wall until it breaks, things just get a lot easier. Um, and realistically, in STEM, and I think we've kind of touched on it, the tech is evolving so quickly. Math is still evolving, believe it or not. There's a ton of new stuff being developed. And so being able to accept that I don't know this, but I will, is the biggest mentality shift I would recommend all of us have in, as you go through your careers and also just in school. Like, And even in my job today, this is what I tell any intern I have for the first year, my first year developers, never ever tell me I can't or I don't know. You should always respond, I don't know, but I can figure out, or I think I can do this. Like, And that's such a big uh thing to overcome uh i'm sure of, many of us have heard of the imposter syndrome uh before eight years in still on an almost daily basis 
as I move up uh, in my career, as I get you know bigger assignments and more complex assignments, same. I always have to just sit there and go, it's okay. I don't know this. I'm going to take a few hours. I'm going to take a few days, weeks, whatever. I'm just going to figure this out, and then I'll you know collaborate with my coworkers and my bosses and my leads, and they'll, they'll help me out. Um, and so, secondary to that, as far as the community support group that I found when I was in college, very distinctly, I think the number one. Uh, thing I did in college that helped me in my career is that I found the people that cared just as much as I did about their future. And, you know, I know this might be a stigma that some people may face in community colleges, but this kind of is in general, like, there are some people you will meet in your classes who don't care as much as you, who don't need this career, who don't need this degree as much as you do. Um, and, you know, hang out with them on weekends, or whatever, but don't tie yourself to those people, like find the ones who care as much as you. Um, the group that I found in college, we worked together on weekends, we made sure we helped each other, we're still great friends to this day, we don't work together, unfortunately, but we're still in contact and like, just having a group of people who are going to push you, just as you can push them is super, super important. Um, a quick, you know, anecdote that I had where what helped me realize the people I would want to attach myself to is, uh, you know, going to school for gaming. I remember three students in one of my programming classes told the teacher, hey, we're going to miss this test and we're not going to be able to turn into assignment because we have to go to BlizzCon, which is like a gaming convention uh, down in Southern California. And they decided going to a gaming convention was more important than learning how to make games. I decided those people were not uh, folks I was going to attach myself to going forward in, in college. And I'm glad I didn't. They're doing various ones are doing various levels in their careers, but I am very happy with the group that I chose to push me and yeah, find people that are going to work just as hard as you. Okay, um, Caroline, I'm not sure if you still have your hand up. Let's go to Bill next. Yeah, I was going to say one of the things that I think was um, a little bit maybe it's not really surprising in the scheme of things, but at Microsoft, one of the things that I realized going along with Jay's discussion of imposter syndrome is to realize that I am not the smartest guy in the room, right? In, in any given meeting at Microsoft, I am not the smartest guy in the room. Uh, and then you have to come back and realize that's not just why they hired me, right? They hired me because of the particular combination of skills. It's not just that I could be smart when I needed to be, but that I had the people skills when I needed to have them, that I had this set of skills, that I could integrate things more than other people, that I could see a bigger picture than other, what, whatever it is, right? You can't always think that just because somebody may be better than you, that that's a reason that you are not supposed to be there, right? They hired you for your particular combination of things. You are the only you who brings all of that together. And so you have to eventually give up on that and say, I know that I'm not the smartest one, but it doesn't matter. I'm here for a perfectly good reason. And I have a lot to bring to the party and that's okay, right? So. Thank you. Caroline, I think you still have your hand up. So please speak. Sure, thanks Molly. And I really wanna echo a lot of things that Bill and Jay already said. Um, and I think I would frame it maybe a little different than Jay, although I totally respect that mentality. Um, I think that it is important as a person who did all of the working three jobs, um, living on my own as you know an 18, 19 year old person doing that piece and then going to school full time. Um, I worked really hard and I worked weekends and if I wasn't working, I was doing school. If I wasn't doing school, I was working. And that is a way to do it, but is not the only way to do it. And if I were to give my past self some advice and other people feel free to disagree with me on this, I would say that it all depends on what your values are. Now my values would be that I would choose to take two more years to finish my degree and not worry about the fact that I had to get it done in a certain time frame. For some people, they might not have that flexibility. And at the time, I didn't feel like I did. But I, I look at it back now with more information. And, and I could have made different choices. And I, I missed out on a lot of the pieces around college that were social. Um, a lot of the other pieces that really make you that more well-rounded person that Bill's talking about, where you're able to come into a situation. And so I had to kind of pick those skills up later. So, 
and, and in a less fun way. So I guess I would say, I know not everyone's a traditional college student where they're coming to college and they're 18, 19, um, but whatever age or stage in your life you're coming to college, remember that there's a whole experience around college and it's not just attaining knowledge and it's not just attaining degree, a degree, that's a big part of it, but there's all of this other, um, aspect of creating community. And when I really think about what has sustained me over the long haul of my career um, in STEM, it was community. And that wasn't always the people who worked the hardest or, you know, this sort of thing. Sometimes it was the people who were um, really willing to um, listen when you're feeling that imposter syndrome and empathize um, and support and encourage you when you feel like, you know, maybe I'm just too stupid and I can't get this because I know I've been there a lot of times. So I think it's really about for you, what do you value in a community? What do you need in a community? And how do you attract the people that provide what you need for support, which could look very different depending on when, whether you're me or Jay or Bill or Dom or Catherine or Alyssa, we're all going to need different different types of community. So really reflecting on what you need um, to help support you and then going out and seeking it. Um, and, and to the best of your ability, not being afraid to ask for help and reach out if you don't know something. Um, and yeah. Great, thank you. And Catherine, I wonder if I can call on you um, to talk a little bit about community and maybe your journey, you mentioned you transferred schools and I don't know if that um, addresses that question at all. Yes, um, thank you, Molly. So um, I actually had a scholarship to attend Tuskegee University. So I lost my scholarship after my junior year and made the decision to go back home because um, going to an in-state school was a lot less expensive than um, attending a private institution, which Tuskegee was. And so, um, that was an extremely difficult transition for me. I grew up in Maryland, and so I always looked at the University of Maryland as a 13th grade, and I didn't necessarily want to continue education with my um, high school classmates because I knew that's where the majority of them were going to go. Um, so I went in with a lot of um, bias already, plus, you know, having to move back home. So like kind of losing that part of independence and, and feeling like I was taking a step back versus taking a step forward. And then what ended up turning out was like not all of my credits transferred. So even though I was a junior, I wasn't like a junior junior. And so I knew I was going to have to spend an extra um, year or more um, to get the degree. And then by that time, I really wasn't in love with engineering <laughs> at all. And the thing that helped keep me on that path was the community that I built uh, along the way. So um, I remember um, the biggest, you know, going to college was finding those, um, you know, kind of kindred spirits as Anna Green Gable says. Um, so like, I remember walking nights at Tuskegee around the campus um, and we'd just be singing and it'd be midnight and I'd never been out that late <laughs> before in my life but we're just walking around talking I'm getting to know people from various places and that kind of helped me um, move day by day because like the school stuff um, came a little easier <laughs> to me so it wasn't like I was spending you know those first couple of years really in the books until it got until I until it did get that way um, and so I wasn't like extremely in love with what I was studying, but it was the relationships that I was building and learning about other people's stories and um, experiencing um, a little bit of life the way that um, my classmates were that really kind of helped me to feel connected because with my scholarship, I had a clear path on what was going to come next. And all I had to do was go day by day. So when I got disrupted and I had to rethink what that looked like coming to the moving back home and coming to the university, my community, like, believe it or not, became my family. So like my youngest sister, who's like 14 years younger than me, became my best friend. <laughs> and like, so we were roommates. Um, I would pick her up from, from um, elementary school at the time. We'd eat together. Um, and then when I could, I, um, and I, and I ended up moving on to University of Maryland's campus. She would come and visit me um, and I take her around the campus and things like that. But I really ended up spending a lot of time with my baby sister. And she was she was the one that helped keep me grounded 
throughout the rest of my time at school because it had been extended. Um, and in addition to that, there was another African American woman who was kind of in the same um, class classes I was taking. So I built friendships with her and we didn't really bond around the schoolwork. We bonded around our common experience of you know, pretty much like sticking out in class. We weren't the ones who had our hands raised. Um, I don't think we got a lot of mentoring from our um, faculty and others. And so we were just bonding around our common experience as black women in uh, this, um, in STEM. And then um, I found community with people who weren't necessarily within the engineering department, but around campus. And this even extended to when I went to graduate school. So the women um, who I would, um, you know, I was working on campus jobs. So it was the women in those areas that really helped um, keep me afloat who were saying you can do this you can do this you can do this like they were constantly the ones who were pouring that into my soul and then when I finally got connected with the office of minorities in science and engineering then I found you know my family and that's I hadn't even though I went to a historically black college I was not a part of the National Society of Black Engineers because I was like well we're all black here anyways so I didn't really know what the value of a being in that group was. When I got to Maryland, I found out, I was like, man, I should have started my freshman year, but you know, whatever, lesson learned. So that's when, you know, I would go to the Office of um, Minorities in Science and Engineering. Um, it would just be full of students coming in and out, doing various things. But I tell you, I wasn't bonding over the classwork itself. I was bonding over being in an environment that made me feel safe, that made me feel welcome, and that let me know that, yes, I can do this, and I don't need to know what it looks like right now, but I can just continue forward. So I literally limped across <laughs> the French line, <laughs> like, no joke. Like, I did not know if I was going to finish or not. And as a matter of fact, I have very interesting stories about my actual graduation, but let me tell you, um, find those people that are going to keep you inspired, that are going to keep you um, um, somewhat accountable, because I did have folks ask me, like, you know, you're watching TV, you're not studying, what's going on, you know, can we talk through this type of thing, and um, who are going to keep you really encouraged, because um, it's, it's not easy, but I don't want to say it's hard either, it's just a journey, and everyone's journey looks differently, so, so that's my two cents. Thank you so much. Um, and there's one uh, thank you also to all the panelists answering um, questions that were specific to them in the chat. I really appreciate that. There's one that's to Catherine, um, but I'm going to broaden it to all of our educators. And that is you made the switch from working in the field to education and we've got you know others who went directly to education and then bill you know have been in both worlds can you speak to you know was that your plan or what drew you to education um so i I love, let me, the best thing about um, being at Boeing was being um, in the hangar with the airplanes. Like me and the 777 bonded like nobody's business, let me tell you. And there's no greater feeling than being around these really great big machines that kind of help you like see your place in the world. So to me, that made it worth what I had put in to get to that point. Um, but I noticed that where I was really thriving and growing in my career at work was all of the um, people stuff that I was doing. So I was on the diversity council for airplane systems. I was a member of the Boeing Black Employee Association. Um, I had inserted myself into the Boeing Management Association, which is another good story because I like to say, even though something doesn't necessarily have your title, what you think you can do with it, there's always ways workarounds to do in it. Um, and I was doing a lot of outreach into the community. Um, so people, I got known for, if you call Catherine, yes, she will go get off work and travel in Seattle traffic to come and talk to your students. And so I enjoyed um, being out and I always kind of knew, knew about myself that I was like a natural educator in some kind of way I would be in education. I just didn't know 
what that would look like. And I thought that it might be because um, Boeing and, and a lot of major companies, they do have people that do specific things with K through 12 and, and college as well. So there are other kinds of positions. Um, but um, in particular, when I was not in love with being with the 777, I was like, I got to do it something else. Like there has to be another um, change. And, um, and I thought maybe it might be going into like managing and I could still go back into managing, but um, I really wanted to be with, um, with you all, with the students. Um, you all give me life and I enjoy um, working um, with students. And so I was like, okay, I'll try it and, and see what it's like. And um, I'm learning a lot along the way, but I'm extremely happy for my decision. And we're happy to have you. Um, Bill, you had your hand up. Yeah, I was just going to say for me, it was it was kind of like I couldn't not teach in some way. I've, I've uh, been teaching in some capacity since I was young and, you know, dabbled in it here and there. Uh, but I think for me, there was great satisfaction in proving that I could do the technical stuff, you know, going to Microsoft and having a career there and, and making sure that I wasn't believing that those who can do and those who can't teach, you know, there's that old adage, and you know, I like, I don't want to think that I could be in that realm. I want to prove that I've got the chops to do the real stuff, but I still love teaching. And so for me, the teaching part is also more giving back because at Microsoft, you can say, yay, we ship Microsoft Word and it's great because my work is out in the world. And, you know, like that gives me a lot of satisfaction, but the personal investment that you can make when you're teaching and the impact that you can make on people's lives one-on-one -on -one, is really rewarding in teaching. So uh, I couldn't help but sort of go back and forth. And, uh, and I'm glad that I've landed here in a, in a, in a role that lets me uh, really interact with a lot of students and, and uh, give back in that way and you know, help them in the way that I'm so appreciative of other teachers helping me in the past. So can't, I can't not do it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I know students are starting to drop off. I'm going to launch one little poll to ask what you thought of the event and what else you want to see. But then I want to ask other of those who've wound up in education if they want to answer that question. I can answer. So I alluded to this before. I, I was one of those people who liked science to begin with because I thought there was always a right answer. And then I got into a lab and I was working in a basement in a place with no windows with my test tubes, my beakers, and nothing was working out as it was supposed to on paper. And um, during the same time, those graduate school. So I was also teaching and working in the tutoring center. And I like could not wait till the clock would strike and I'd get to run and be with my students. And so that was my indication that um, you know, the science is interesting, but it doesn't work and it can be frustrating and, and I much enjoy talking about science and um, thinking about broad science rather than focusing on one small sliver that um, doesn't always work as you want. Thank you. And you know, that also speaks to you know, just how valuable that real life experience is. Um, this isn't STEM, but I thought I was going to be a lawyer and then I worked in a law office and I hated it. So yeah, not there. Um, okay, do we have any other questions from our students or our audience or panelists for each other? If, if there's nothing, I, I'd like to just make a comment kind of echoing what I said in the chat that, you know, places may not be ideal about where you work at uh, to Jonathan's question um, and they may not fit you um, morally uh, 100 percent but it doesn't mean that you can't be that change and I say that because like I said I've only been at Boeing for about a year and a half but I'm all right like my my technical mentor has become as a, as a director I also network with another senior manager and these are all because of things that I wanted to see change in Boeing regarding um diversity and inclusion topics and things that I was just like, hey, you know, so I was always asking questions to everybody because nobody told me no. So I'm not going to stop until somebody says no. I'll actually have uh, one more plus one to what Don was saying. I agree with 100% everything you said. Uh, one piece of advice I will give because I've been in similar situations is when you're ready to make help your company be better and make changes to not just your company, but to your team, to the people around you. Just make sure you're also uh, working very hard and like at your job. Uh, I have unfortunately worked with people who try to push for you know big changes and big things, but because they weren't 
the best of employees, uh, that kind of falls on deaf ears. So just, just remember, and for those of us who are part of minority groups or unrepresented groups, it sucks, but just know that we are rep representatives for a large group of people and just make sure you're putting your best foot forward for yourself, but also for the people that you're trying to, you know, get, you know, in, into the careers, into the same path that you tread, you've tread as well. Okay. Well, um, we had one other stock question, um, which was about, you know, what are common and not common pathways? You know, what should students explore when they're beginning? I don't know that we want to try and answer that in three minutes. We could take a stab or if, are there any kind of closing comments that you want to share with students who are starting their journey in STEM? I'd say there's room for a lot of diversity of thought and diversity of interest, especially when you start talking about software engineering. You know, there, there is software behind everything in the world, and there's a company that does stuff that relates to your interests and your hobbies and your passions. So whatever you're into, if it's video games, then Jay knows that. If it's developing software for whatever, I got to do that. If you're into music, they're like anything you're interested in, all the diverse things that you bring together, you can find a spot that uses some of those in an interesting way. So don't think you have to be one thing, right? You can bring all those interests and sometimes find a really interesting job that matches exactly, right? So don't, don't give up the other interests and think that you only have to be, you know, one thing, right? You're, you're the package and it can be cool somewhere, right? All right, Caroline, you have your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to add that what really struck me about this whole panel is that each one of us changed our minds at some point. And I think a lot of times when we start out on our academic career path, we think, oh gosh, if I change my mind, it's going to be terrible and I'm never going to finish. But the reality is, I think people finish when they do what they're passionate about. So if you find something unexpected that really excites your passion and you have the will and the drive and the desire to go for it, like I really encourage people to take healthy risks in that way, right? Everyone on this panel took a healthy risk at one point or another to change tack and do something because they felt um, passionate about it. And I just would really encourage students to consider um, follow your passion if you have that that drive and motivation um, and don't be afraid to make a change if, if that's really what's right for you. And kind of adding on to that, everything, and this has come up in earlier um, parts of the conversation, but every piece of your history, every piece of your lived experience brings something to your new team, even if it's not specifically what you're being asked to do right now, today on your project. Um, and so um, your whole self to, to it and it, Again, a good company, a good team will value that. And, and lastly, or not lastly, sorry, but I'd also add, uh, you know, and it's never too late to change. I, I think we've even said it, you've seen it here a couple of times, like we're all like, spoiler, I think I've got maybe five to 10 more years in game development, but I actually want to be a teacher. Right? I'm hoping I can do this with everyone 10 years from now and be a teacher. Uh, and like, I'm going to do that because I want to, and I know I can. And so even if you find yourself down one path here at some company and it's not what you, what you want to do, plenty of time, plenty of opportunity to find something more interesting that you want to do. We'll find a spot for you, Jay. Just let us know. Come on, Jay. Yeah, and I may or may, I, I may be hinting at that. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then also for me, like I, I did mechanical engineering. I graduated mechanical engineering and I love mechanical engineering because it's, it's like everything you can see or you touch has to do with mechanical engineering. There's nothing that doesn't. And, um, but however, I'm changing and I'm pursuing a master's in uh, data science. And that comes from, stems from me ha also having one course in my um, college that I was taking a computer science course and I really loved it. Like I would spend hours on a problem trying to figure it out and I enjoyed all of it, but I didn't want to change my major for a third time and go for, spend another two years there. So ultimately that's why I'm leaving and I'm changing now. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, this has been amazing. We've got some amazing comments um, to thank the panelists in the chat. Um, I'm going to stop our recording now. <laughs>